Can anyone, in their own words, kind of just up to this point, what, what do you what do you remember? What's jumped out to you in in the study so far? Looking at John one verses one through we did fourteen, but we're doing fourteen again today. But well, one through fourteen so far. First week we didn't get out of verse one. Y'all suffered through that that lesson. Um, then the next week we did one through fourteen. What do you what do you recall from those those two weeks in your own in your own words? What jumped out to you? I just always like the way John talked in verse one when I started out. Yeah. Right out there, spelling out there about how down about. What about the progression that we're seeing in John one? What what can you say about that? The progression that we're seeing. From, from verse 1 that through, you know, getting to verse 14, and it's going to, that progression is still going to continue, but what do you remember about us talking about that last week? You, you weren't here, were you? It's been a few weeks. Okay, two weeks ago. <laughs> Okay, since we're going to, two weeks ago, now maybe you'll talk. <laughs> They're like, well, last week we weren't here, so I'm not going to, so two weeks ago, answer the question. Quit <laughs> stalling. Wait, what verse? You kind of, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 1 through back in two weeks. <laughs> so the progression we saw first was that he establishes that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, Okay. And now, as we're going through John 1, it's not just this, this vague, oh, so, the, okay, the Word's God, the Word was, okay, the Creator. Of the, but now we're getting into who the Word is. It's not just, okay, the, there's God, He created. That, 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 that God is, is described as the Word, and that Word became flesh. Okay, well, it still would lead you with, well, who? Okay, well, who's this person? Now we see it progressing to, we know who it is. And we're going to see, uh, as we go through this, there are three confessionals, a confessional statement of who Jesus is, identifying that he is the Messiah. So, who's willing to be my reader for today? Loud and proud. All right. So, Susan, would you be so kind as to read verses 4 through 16? 14 through 16. 14, not 4. Yes, I'm done. 14 through 16. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah. The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed His glory. The glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me has surpassed me because He existed before me. Indeed, we will all receive grace after grace from His fullness. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. One more verse. No, no. one, pardon? You read through 17 anyway. Well, it was okay. <laughs> it, it, besides, I have a quick, I just have a quick thing. And then we go to 17, 18. It had so a you're comma. good. Well, I had to finish the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> what a teacher. She was on a roll. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, we, we actually have a good summary of 1 through 13 in verse 14. Okay, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen His glory. Glory, I mean, obviously, this is the test. This is John, the apostle, writing. Okay, he knows who Jesus is. But now he's going to get into who John the Baptist is, and John the Baptist attesting to who Jesus is. Okay, verse 17 and 18, please. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side. He has revealed Him. All right. Here we finally have the word being defined for the first time as who He is. John outright says it. Who? Jesus. Jesus is the way. So all this explanation of the word and, and, and just the vastness of, of who God is being defined as the word. Now we see it's Jesus. John just says it, right? 
Now, re, now I want, I'm going to reread verses 16 through 18 in, in, in the context so that we can look at the, what he's saying about the law. Okay? For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is, the Father, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Now, there are those who believe, and I, or there are those who say, and I believe they are mistaken, that John speaks of the law or the old covenant in a negative light, as if Moses had this, but then here comes Jesus. Okay? I think they're in error with that. In fact, looking back to Moses, um, looking at what Moses had in the light of what Jesus gives clearly must be understood as being in a positive light. Meaning, we can't just overlook the law. We can't look back at the Old Testament and, and say, well, that's not important. If, if, if someone says that we need to unhitch from it or that it's not important, or what, any, they're, they're definitely in error. Not just that, but what does Scripture say? Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, don't think I've come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. Okay, so Jesus didn't come to just tear it apart and go, well, that's garbage. He came to fulfill it. And then you have to look at the Apostle Paul. How did the Apostle Paul view the law? He said in, in Romans 3.31, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. In Romans 7, verse 7, he says, What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if, yet if it had been... If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known that I that what it is to what it is to covet if the law did not say you shall not covet. So what's Paul he even goes on in, in, in Galatians and says, it's a schoolmaster. The law is a schoolmaster. Now, typically we don't when we think of a schoolmaster, that's one thing. But in Paul's day, you had private tutors, and these private tutors were very specific in their education of you, and, and it went quite literally across multiple facets of your life. Okay? They were molding you as a thinker. Now, Paul had a tutor who was quite a prominent Pharisee, and Paul was tutored under him. Paul says in Galatians 3, he says, So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So if it were not for the law, we would not know our need for a Savior. And why is that? The law lays out, this is, this is God's law. Now, the ceremonial law and the civil law don't apply. Now, granted, we do see still parallels in the Old Testament of civil law. So, if you steal something, you owe compensation. Those principles still are prevalent even in today. However, the law that certainly still applies no matter what is the moral law, right? The moral law comes from God's, crea God's being, who he is in his creation. So, morality is not defined by the culture, what the culture deems to be appropriate. It doesn't fluctuate. Morality, as Romans 1 says, that's written on our heart, that is defined by the nature and character of God. That moral law is universal no matter what, always. And that's what Paul's calling back to, saying without that law, we would have no idea that where we are, that we are standing currently as sinners at odds with God. And anyone who is faced with that, you see this in Acts, when Peter goes up to preach the first sermon, they're cut to the heart, and what is their question to, to Peter? Well, do we do? What do we do? <laughs> but they, they ask, what do we do to be saved? Why? Because they're faced with the law. This is who God is. And so Paul doesn't overlook it. Paul doesn't think the Old Covenant or the Old Testament is something to be overlooked or unhitched from or whatever. In fact, he says, without it, I would not have known that I should not covet. Now, there are those who will argue, you don't have to tell someone not to do da 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 and they'll throw out some extreme example. Well, yeah, you do. 
You do have to tell people not to do things. You do have to, and, and so God's moral law is universal. It does not change because he does not change. And Paul says that law is what convicts us. That law is what reveals to us we don't match up. And for those who come to Christ, we recognize, well, how can I ever be reconciled to God knowing that I don't match up? And that's where the gospel comes in. Any thoughts so far? Makes sense. Um, verses 19 through 23. It's still me. You are my reader. Okay. But only if you read 19 through 23. <laughs> comma or not. You're about to get fired. <laughs> there isn't a comma. I think it ends with a period. This is John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He did not refuse to answer, but he declared, I am not the Messiah. What then, they asked him, are you Elijah? I am not, he said. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Who are you then, they asked. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. All right, so two weeks ago, we covered this a little bit. John, uh, John the Baptist outright says, I'm not the Messiah. Certainly people, you know, probably wrongfully thought so. You got this guy with this weird eating habit. He's dressed different. He's unique. Quite literally, probably a dynamic speaker. I mean, but he was very bold. If you recall, we were going through one of my favorite books back from college, is the, the Synopsis of the Gospels. And we were able to, you know, look at what this story being covered differently in, in the Gospels, because they recorded it differently. And so we were able to kind of see the train of, you know, or the, the chain of events. They come out, and he immediately rebukes them, calls them brood of vipers, refuses to baptize them. Why? Because their baptism is not of repentance. And so he refuses, it. and then here we see in John, they're like, well, well, well who are you? Why are you, why are, you know, are you the prophet? And, and that's something that we're about to touch on a little bit, too. So John says, I'm not the Messiah. But he does know who he is. Okay, He's the one making straight. He knows, look, the Messiah is coming. 24, 25. Now they did sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him, why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. So we were wondering about last week when, when they said, are you the prophet? Um, Crystal was correct. There, there's a prophecy that speaks of the prophet, and that's a prophecy for the Messiah. We get caught up on prophet as being somebody less than, but it's that's why when we look at it here, and fortunately for us in English, they've capitalized it in verse 21. So it, was, it is a prophecy of the, regarding the Messiah. Uh, but I don't want to, but what I want to do is I want to point out an interesting theme in chapter one. And the theme is found in, if you want to write it down, mission. Okay? John had a mission. What was John's mission? He just said to the Pharisees. Make straight the way. Make straight. Okay? He's, he's, okay, look, he's paving the way before the Messiah comes. All right? Jesus had a mission. And what was Jesus' mission? Seek to save the lost. Seek to save the lost. The Pharisees, we see, had a mission. And they go out there and, well, who are you? And he tells them who he is, says the Messiah is coming. Then when the Messiah comes, they don't see him because they're of, of their mission. And their mission, and this is why it's so important, this is why this theme is so important. What's the underlying difference between John and Jesus, their mission versus the Pharisees? Are you okay to guess and be wrong? Yeah, I want you to talk. <laughs> um, the Pharisees were more about following the law. Okay. Their mission was to make sure everyone checked off those boxes. And, and, and boxes they made. Mm -hmm. You know, I made this box, you follow this box, right? <laughs> We're, 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 I mean, this is going to sound silly, but John and, and Jesus, were, were, were their missions 
God from God? Yes. Okay, we can go, yeah, sure. And the Pharisees? No. No. The Pharisees were, to me, they're, they're like, they look pretty on the outside, but they were very filthy on the inside. Like Jesus, whitewashed tombs, right? Yeah. The, re the reason why I bring this out is, you know, I want us to kind of run with this for a moment. We know as a church, as a church, First Christian Church, we know that we have a mission. But what about you? What is your mission? To bring as many people to Christ as we possibly can. I know for me, my, the burden, the burden on my heart is, is is similar to what he what he said to the to, to Peter. The the burden on my heart is to, to feed God's people, to make sure that they're maturing in their faith, to make sure they're growing in knowledge and wisdom. I'm not exempt from obviously the Great Commission. But the, the great burden on my heart is to feed the sheep, okay? So what? So individually, the reason why I bring this up is, can we have an idea of what we're supposed to be doing and it not be God's will? Yeah. We can have our will, right? And what happens when it's at odds with God's will? Let's... <laughs> there was an older gentleman I went to church with in uh, Cookville. Uh, his name was Walter Wheatley. And his big thing was, he says, you're going to be faced with all kinds of decisions you have to make. And sometimes the Holy Spirit won't lead you one way or the other. It's a decision left entirely to you. When you have, are faced with those decisions and you make them, all you have to do is watch what the Lord blesses. Some things are going to fail. But even in failure, there are lessons to be learned. Yeah. And, you know, the big thing is to keep striving for the kingdom. And you will know pretty quick what the Lord's will is because he'll bless your efforts or he'll cause them to fail. But either way, you need to act. How important is it that, that, that our mission, and we know that our mission is from God? I mean, for the Pharisees, and what they perceive to be their mission... The, the difference between that was eternal life and eternal damnation, plain and simple. Yeah. Now, does it mean that your mission is going to have that kind of weight to it? Maybe not. But when, when we approach life and we, we put our will up against his will, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be faced with heartache, stress, disappointment, failure, Essentially, it's we need to make sure that our mission is not up against his mission, that our will is not up against his will. We can have a will of our own, and it can be completely at odds with God. And, 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 and on paper, we might think our will is a good one. It's, it's a good will to do, but it's not his will. Though, on our, though when we look at it, we think, if I do this, this can happen, this can happen, this can happen. But God's going, but if but you do what I want, more than what you could imagine is going to happen. Because what, what's God after? God's after saving, seeking and saving the lost, right? The Bible says that he doesn't wish that any be perish. The Bible says there's more celebration over one sinner who comes to salvation than, you know, like we talked about last week, the 99 who really don't exist, you don't need it. All right? Everyone's like, all right, whose car is going off? Somebody's car. Look, we'll figure it out, and if, and if you hear it kind of slowly fading, we'll just call the cops and... They'll figure it out. Marty's on security. He should be up there looking at He's probably making his way there. He might have been one from the Now, all right, so I, I just I want to kind of take that sidetrack because we know John had a mission, we know Jesus had a mission, and the Pharisees had a mission. But the difference was is John and John and Jesus, their whoever, missions were whoever parked in front of the swing set. In front of the swing set. But there's only one car in front of the oh, swings. Okay. One car in front of the swings. Yeah, right in, in front of the swings. That's why the same car was going off. They went off pulled in front of the swing sets. <laughs> those, those swing sets are cursed. How would it go off? In my opinion, Jesus and John were out to say to bring people in. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees was out to stop them. They wanted yeah. to try to make them look. In my opinion, they were just, they were on the opposite. Oh, yeah. Completely. Well, you, I mean, you could say God's will, our will. Yeah. You know, that could be complete opposite. But it only, it only, 
it's like you said, if it, if everybody stayed in their their own little boxes that they made, uh -huh. they're happy campers, but how dare they think outside of that box. And and and, and, and woe to you when his will comes and not because yeah. his will's going to happen. His will's going to play. So it's kind of like you can either get in front of the train or you can get on when he stops and calls you on. Mm -hmm. But so many times we, we want to go about it like the Pharisees go, no, 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 no. This is ours and then we justify it by no, it's good because of this reason, whatever. And then, as the saying goes, get off the track when the train's coming through. Verses uh, 20, verse 26 through 27. I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. Actually, go through 29, because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this next point, because I think we covered it. All this happened in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right, so there are three times we see confessional identifications of Jesus. Two of them are made by John the Baptist, and then one of them is made by John the Baptist's previous disciple who then became a disciple of Jesus, and that's Andrew. Bonus points, who's, who's Andrew's brother? Peter. Peter. Okay, so, and then Peter worked with who? Two other disciples? John James. John James. Whose dad was? Zebedee. There you go. So... Jesus took out all his employees and, and just made them disciples. So there's three outright identifi identifying proclamations. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And two of them are by John the Baptist and then one by Andrew. Um, I found it interesting. Now granted, we're not, we're not harboring on it because that's not the point. But in Leviticus, we see that a male goat and a female goat uh, being offered as a sin offering, but we also see a female lamb. Now, the gender of the animal does not play any significant role beyond the fact that a female lamb was more affordable than a male. Okay? If, if, I know our culture really wants to emphasize gender. And by really emphasizing it, they've just eroded it all together. Um, so I don't want us to get caught up in, you know, calls him the Lamb of God, yet, you know, we see a female, that's not it. What we do see in Leviticus, because of you have male and female being permissible, we know that the female animal was more affordable to the average family. What we can really take from Leviticus, and now we see the proclamation of Jesus as the Lamb of God, is even in the Old Testament, God was very conscious of people very conscious of their state, where, what they could do. What, essentially, what, what I'm getting at is, Jesus, God's going, I'll take the cheaper female because it's more affordable. I want your sins forgiven. Okay? Whether it's a male, female, it goes down the line of, and then it also progresses to, if you can't even afford that, two does. Which, if you recall, that's exactly what was offered by Jesus' parents, right? Jesus wasn't loaded. Well, there goes the prosperity gospel right out the window. So, the re what I see in this is, in Leviticus, we see God laying out, here's the process by which you're supposed to sacrifice. Very specific procedure. But we see, we see a level of what people are able to afford. And, and what I want us to walk away from that is, is how available God wanted his forgiveness to be from sin to all people. You bring that to now to the New Testament with Christ. Who is Jesus constantly with? He's with the, he's with the people who can't even go into the temple. The Pharisees wouldn't let them in the temple. He's with the ones who, who probably couldn't even afford the two doves. Why? Because the Pharisees have, have missed it. So clearly, God is saying, I want... I don't want my forgiveness to be blocked out from anyone. Now, under the Old Covenant, by His grace, he's, he's allowed us to put our sin upon an animal and that animal to bear the consequences of our sin. That is gracious. And yet, even in that, He makes certain that His sin forgiveness through the sin offering is available to everybody. 
So when we come to Jesus, that hasn't changed. He hasn't shut the door on anybody. But the Pharisees somehow lost this understanding of how God wanted his forgiveness to be readily available to anyone. Money should not be an issue. And yet the Pharisees come away complete opposite. Complete opposite. Again, this goes back to the mission. You don't know your mission. Where are you landing? The Pharisees are landing where you can't come. You're too, you're too unclean. At what point, where in Scripture do we see too unclean, too unforgivable, unable to be forgiven by God, unable to be saved? Like we don't see any anywhere in Scripture. But that's where the Pharisees came out. When your will is at odds with, with his will, that's what we're finding. So it's, it's not that... You know, I want to get caught up on the, the, the male-female part, but the reason why male-female is females were cheaper. And then he goes down the line with two turtle doves. And, and the reason why I want us to look at that is to understand he's always been about forgiving everyone. No one's been excluded. But now the Pharisees are excluded. Now we know why John's calling them out as hard as he is. You, you brood of vipers. You know, you whitewash tombs. You... You know, that's got to be said. Any thoughts? Pharisees from the get go, their, their idea of a Messiah was a worldly yeah. Messiah that was going to put them in power. Yeah. They would have rule over everybody. Well, what John was, and, and Jesus as well, was a threat to their authority. Yeah. I mean, it's just like John calling them out here. You know, they're not used to that. Can, they, can people fall under, fall under that? Kind of approach to things. Sure. Yeah. You you come again. Right now. You come against my authority, and you know, but it can happen certainly in the church too. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, it can absolutely happen in the church. So that's why, you know, for example, we did we just had you know elder deacon nominations. That's why we vet. That's why we go through. Well, it's real simple. What are the cr criteria? It's right there in scripture. All right. Does this person fit the criteria? No. Then they're out. You know, it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, it, it, you may not make friends if somebody's power hungry, but I almost, I'm a little concerned if somebody wants to be an elder. <laughs> they, there was a, I, was, I met with a young man today, uh, I met up with a pastor, and he brought uh, an intern who's going to be interning at his church. And, and he's been working in, with churches for some time. And I go, so you've gotten to see how the sausage gets made. He goes, to a great extent. And I go, and you still want to do this? <laughs> he goes, I think God's calling me. I said, then you need to go. You need to pursue it. If you, if the, if you see how the sausage gets made, you're like, sure. <laughs> you're messed up. You're ready for this. <laughs> Verses 30 through 34. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who has surpassed me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I watched the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, The one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. All right. Hearty high five to anyone who can answer this. The difference that we see here in, in John and Matthew, what is, what is his response to when he sees Jesus in Matthew? How does that interaction go? Or, or just think elsewhere in another gospel. Because I think it happens the same way in Luke. When he sees Jesus coming and it's time to baptize him, what does John do? I'm not worthy. You should baptize him. Okay. Me. And, and then the Spirit of God comes down, rests on him. And, and in John, it's, he said, I didn't, I didn't know. I, don't, I didn't know who the Messiah was. I didn't, I didn't know. But it, it seems like, if he's like, no, you need to be baptizing me, he, does that, it seems like, at face value, you know, possibly a contradiction, right? Because um, after all, how do you not know? I mean, he's your family member. Now, you could say... Then maybe it's similar to his brothers, Jesus' brothers, who were not going to come to faith until they saw an example. For example, for them it was the resurrection. But in Matthew, we see him immediately, no, you know, behold, you, you need to, you should be baptizing me, I'm not worthy, so on. 
At first, it seems like a contradiction, but I was reading through a commentary that actually, I think, brings a lot of clarity to it. John would know Jesus as family, right? Yeah. So, he knew the conduct of Jesus, knew his character, knew how he, how he, how he certainly carried himself. Have you ever had a, a situation where someone you knew who, who, was, who was further along in, in their faith, that they, they're closer to God, they, they live out faith just differently, and then they come to you and ask you for prayer, and you're like, you should be praying for me. Okay, have you ever had that experience? Okay, this is, this is more likely what we're seeing. We're, we're whoa, 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 you already know you're better than me. You know, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, let's just permit it. And then he does it, and then the Holy Spirit comes down. And John says, that's what God told me. God told me the one whom the whole... He knew Jesus was godly, and he knew Jesus was godlier than him. But until he saw what God said would happen with the Holy Spirit resting upon him... He, he didn't know that Jesus was, but he certainly knew that Jesus was different, that, that he was godlier than him. So John knew he shouldn't be baptized. He should be baptizing Jesus. That's what I believe we're seeing here. Whoa, 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 you should be baptizing me. You're better off than I am, right? And so I don't think there is a contradiction here. I think that that's the way it flows. That's the way it really tracks. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now we're getting into a, the calling of the disciples, which we're not going to finish up. However, we are going to look at the first bit, because it does show us the second and third proclamations of who Jesus is. Uh, verse 35 and 36. Again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. So, second time, he's, he's professed Jesus, and how does he profess him? How does he describe him? Lamb. lamb of God. And a lamb was used for what, what sacrifice? Sin. Sin offering. So John has called out, this is the lamb of God. This is the one who takes away sins, right? Twice. Now he has two of his disciples with him. For some reason, I really want to know who the second guy is. Because it doesn't tell us. We do know who one is, right? One of them is Andrew. Who's the other guy? At least, at least you hear his name. It was probably too difficult to pronounce anyway. So 37 through 42 is where, we're, is where we will conclude. 37 through 42. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about ten in the morning. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means anointed one. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means rock. So here we see the third uh, proclamation. Can, can I just ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> In verse 39, what time was it? It says 10 a.m. Mine says the 10th hour. Yeah, mine's 4 in the afternoon. 10th hour usually started like 6 o'clock. Sunrise. There. Sunrise. Sun and as far as the time, I mean, the specificity of the time, I think it's <coughs> moderate. I do think it's probably more afternoon, but interpretations, translations of what time. Because you also, for example, like measuring, when, when, when we look at the ark, the, the, they'd say from the elbow to the finger. Does everyone have the same length elbow to the finger? No. So, I mean, how people interpret what this means as far as the time, it's just one of those interesting things we can kind of look at. But What, what trait version are you reading from? Um, the uh, Christian's standards that was called now, mm -hmm. it used to be the Holman. I, yeah, mine says 10th hour, but I was wondering. What is the 10th hour? I but, imagine they got 10 in the morning from 10th hour being from midnight to. That could be, but I, I know that. The, but then I've also heard them functioning very significantly off of sun up, sun down. Because when sun went down, that was the beginning of essentially the next. So when the sun goes down for the Jews, a lot of them <clears throat> did not labor. It could be Friday. As soon as the sun goes down, you're not doing anything till Sunday. 
the sentence before that it says, and they spent that day with him. And right. it was about four in the afternoon. So it's more than likely later on in the day. In, in, interest, I, I, I find that, that interesting. Um, so I here's where... I know where Jesus went. Where, where did he stay? <laughs> This, that's, a, it's a, that's a good question, but it's a good question because what we're asking in that is not actually what, what we need to be at, and I'm going to get to that. So where are you staying is a very good question, but it's the response that Jesus gives that I think really makes the point that, that I want us to emphasize. Um, so two, two very important points to make. Andrew, disciple of Jesus... John the Baptist says, there he is, that's the Messiah. Andrew leaves John, John doesn't seem to have any issue with it, goes and follows, so he's leaving John as a disciple to go and be a disciple of Jesus. That tells us that he trusts John. John says, there he is, Andrew's gone. Thanks, John, been great, going that way, okay? They're going after Jesus now. And so they go up to, them, up to Jesus, they say, Rabbi, Jesus asks them, what are you seeking? The first point that I want to make here is every single person who comes to Christ is asked this question. We, we don't hear it audibly, but the question still remains, what are you seeking? For some, they're, they're seeking fire insurance. I want to be saved. I want to be saved from hell. I'll make a financial contribution periodically and you just make sure that I don't end up in hell. Others will say I want a life that is blessed monetarily. I want a life that is is exempt from health, uh, bad health. Not only will I give to the church, I will give a lot to the church and I will be active in the church, but my but I'm asking that in exchange you give me wealth and you give me health. But for those who are in Christ, they will respond like Andrew, a true believer. What are you seeking? Just you. Just you. And we know that because what does he ask? Where are you staying? Where are you abiding? <coughs> He's asking that if, if I can follow you. If I can be with you. But what's very interesting is... Where do you abide? That brings us to the second point. Where do you abide is asking Jesus if I can follow after you, if I can follow with you, if I can learn and, and be your disciple. John 15, 4 through 9 says, Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are, not, or you are like a branch that is thrown away and withered. <coughs> Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, Ask whatsoever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. That word remain is exactly what they asked in the Greek to Jesus. Where are you abiding? Where are you remaining? And 15 chapters later, Jesus says, remain in me and I will be with you. Remain in me, and I will remain. And then what's the fruit of that? Quite literally, that you will bear much fruit. It's remarkable to see the interaction that Jesus has with Andrew is, is, the, is, the, is the interaction that every believer has upon conversion. What are you seeking? And, and our answer has got to be, just you. Where are you going? That's where I'm going. Wherever you're going, that's where I'm going, Jesus. 
I'm following you and only you, and I'll go wherever. And that falls back on mission. Susan? Um, I think there is one distinct difference, though, between Andrew and the other disciples versus us. They were raised in a Jewish home looking for the Messiah. Most of the converts we're looking at, they're not raised in a home where they're looking for Messiah. So they may come initially, and, not, and I imagine there's even people here, myself included, who started out the journey maybe just hoping that they don't have to go to the, you know, burn in fire. But it's all about that growth to get to the point where you are saying, I just want you. Yeah. I mean... But the, the answer the answer is the same, right? I mean, it might it might have started that you know, you're starting pretty good in the fear of the Lord, taking it even a little too far. But eventually it clicks, and you recognize not only His justice but also His mercy, and 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 what you're what you're seeking, what are you seeking? Went from, well, I just didn't want to go to hell to, well, I just want you now. And, and, and that's, that's a genuine conversion. But that's, that's any genuine conversion. That's what it, it's got to be. Anything other than I just want you is, is something else. If it's fire insurance, if it's I, I, I want this relationship where if I give to you, you do something for me. And then, what? lo and behold, he doesn't do what you think he should do. So then what? You know, this, this is what we went through when we went through Justin Peter's clouds without water. What happens when the healing doesn't come? What happens when, you know, your wife isn't healed, when your husband isn't healed, but that's what you gave for? You know, what happens then? You know, and so every converted person, regardless of how you got there, it, it, the answer was, wherever you're going, I'm going. I just want you. I'll follow you wherever. And, that, and then it concludes with the third confession, which is Andrew going to Peter saying, we found the Messiah. And then the eroding of Zebedee's fishing business. Which I don't know if it was eroded. I'm sure they could have found other fishermen. But, you know, Jesus poached about four employees. Poached. All right. <laughs> is that a pun? Yeah. Well, look at that. All right, so what are your... What are your thoughts? What do you, what's, your, what's your take? What are we seeing here? Because we, we are going to get into other disciples being called, and then we'll get into chapter 2. But what are your thoughts? Now, we very well are, might interact with people who, look, I, I've, got a, I've got a friend who, you know, I wouldn't say he necessarily understands the, the, the gospel. I know, you know, he's kind of like me, where I, I believe there was a God, and I got perfectly no problem with saying that God's Jesus. No problem with it whatsoever. But one of the things that he's talking, he was talking to me about today was, I need, I need to know that my life has purpose. And a lot of people are there. A lot of people, that's, that's ultimately kind of why they're, they're seeking. Maybe that's why they step foot in the church. They need to know that they, they have purpose. And I mean, so I told him, I said, I said, buddy, apart from Christ, there is no such thing as a life without purpose. Every life in Christ has a purpose. So, I mean, whatever the reason might be, the response to what are you seeking is, is going to absolutely define everything else that follows. And so that's ultimately something we have to ask ourselves. If, if, are you finding yourself stepping aside you, you've been under grace. We talked about it Sunday. You've been under grace for some time, but you're, you're starting to redefine this relationship with God to be one of, of, of performance. That if I perform, then, then God will accept me. It's easy to do. Just Even though you're saved by grace, you know it. It's still easy to fall into that trap and, 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 and fall into that obedience-based religion. I think we still need to continue to ask ourselves, what, are we, what am I seeking? Am I seeking just Him or am I... Seeking the things of him. What I might get from him. What he might do for me. Or am I seeking just him? And it's something Christians have to continue to, to, to challenge ourselves with. Any thoughts? Anything pop in your head at all? <laughs> I think a lot of us just have a hard time with... Uh with the grace that we do have 
and that we, we want to earn it. We want to show improvement. We want, you know, everything in our lives, uh, you know, is, you know, if I strive, if I have enough ambition, if I do, if I work hard enough, I'll reach this level, and if I reach that level, I'll set another goal and go to that level. And I think as Christians, we want to do that too, but the way you get there is completely different than the world's way. Uh, you know, our lives are lives of, of sacrifice, not to get more salvation, like we could get more salvation than we already have, but to give, to be instrumental in God's kingdom because he's blessed us so much in appreciation for what he's not done, not to get more, but because it's the right thing to do and the good thing to do. Now, I'm just going to go out on a limb here about your marriage. <clears throat> I assume it's not based upon your performance and then she'll love you more. No, she would have got rid of me long Yeah. <laughs> okay. But but you see how, you know, Jesus God God used marriage as a, as an example of him in the church. See, this is why the church needs to take a hard stance on marriage. Because it's creator and creation. God and the church, man and, and the wife. Man represents God, woman represents creation. It's not creation and creation. There's a reason why he, he uses that. But another reason why is this. Notice that a marriage that is built on performance is a marriage that falls apart. A marriage that is based upon love and affection and, and your acceptance regardless breeds about more love and affection. It provokes in you a greater desire to, to you could say achieve, you can say perform, I don't care. But the basis of it is, is I'm doing because I'm already loved, not so that I do, so that I get that love that I'm after. It's because I have it. Jesus says, those who love me obey me, right? Well, why do we obey? Is it because we're terrified, petrified of what he might do? Or is it because we find ourselves overwhelmed by the mercy and grace that he's given us, which provokes in us a, a response of obedience? <coughs> that, those are two different approaches to relationships, and I guarantee you only one's going to make it. A marriage built on performance always falls apart, and I always falls apart. It is miserable and resentful, and it falls apart. A marriage in which you are loved no matter what, I'm not leaving you no matter what, we made the commitment to ourselves. The, the D word's not even going to be joked about in our house. That's not an option. And certainly infidelity's not an option, so you're stuck. So with that being said, it's okay. Because I have the affection, because I have the commitment, what does that provoke in me? A, a, a response of gratitude, which ultimately provokes greater obedience. Right? Our world has no idea how that works. It's, it's, it's lift yourself up, fight to get to the top, people are going to doubt you, overcome, and da-da-da-da-da. And then when it comes to the cross, and they go, I'll earn it. No, you won't. You can't earn it. And I know because you've already sinned. And anybody who has, has cancer of the liver doesn't go, oh, well, then you're, you're healthy, it's just your, it's your liver. It's, no, you're sick, right? You're sick. And I think as, as we approach life in, in, in this way of understanding, it doesn't matter where it's at. A sick body is a sick body. Okay? My whole body, for example, looking at, at, at the cancer as an example, your whole body is going to be affected by the treatment, Right? Just because you've got, you know, oh, I just struggle here. Your, your, your whole spirit is affected by it. Look at it as tar. When tar clings on to something, it ain't coming off without taking some skin with it. We cannot perform and earn and, and, and remove the things that are destroying our soul based upon our own performance. But as Christians, we still will step out of the grace of which we've given and try to approach God with a performance-based relationship. You take a marriage that is built upon love and acceptance and change it to a marriage that is built upon performance alone, you're, again, you're going to create resentment and bitterness and hatred. And the same goes for God. When we do that, when we are constantly checking ourselves, what are you seeking? And our answer is not just you. We are at danger of stepping out of grace and creating a relationship for ourselves where we begin to hate and resent God rather than love and pursue Him with a greater love and passion than we ever would. Tracking that?
married couples, that's the spur to you now moving forward as well. If your marriage is not built upon love and affection, and there is no, there's no option for anything else, it's got to be. That's the relationship God has with us, and that's what he's commanded us to have with our spouse. Any thoughts, any questions? Tangent over. All right, Jerry, do you mind closing this in prayer? Sure. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity for us to come together and to read your word, Lord, and to uh, uh, have JR here to uh, help us study the scripture, Father. Father, we love you, we do seek you, and we are so thankful to have you in our lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.